Hearing none. Discussion agenda for this afternoon, 5.1, is the 2013 Hamilton Police Service operating budget. Board members, as you know, the budget process for the Hamilton Police Services Board is about ensuring public community safety with fiscal responsibility. As board members, it is our responsibility to discuss, scrutinize, and review the Hamilton Police Services Board 2013 budget. The estimates have been prepared by Chief DeCare and his staff. What I would like to recommend is that we allow the Chief to make his presentation in its entirety. And once he has completed his presentation as Chair, I will open the floor for questions. So Chief, if you could please commence the presentation. Chair of the Police Services Board, Nancy D. Gregorio, members of the Police Services Board, ladies and gentlemen. The Hamilton Police Service has posted the last three budgets online. We have made presentations of the budget in public sessions and town hall meetings. Community members can now also participate through the alternative live streaming process that has been established. And for those that do wish to follow along, the 2013 draft budget submission is available online at the Hamilton Police Service website. Uh, directly in the middle of the page entitled 2003 Budget. <clears throat> Board members, the Hamilton Police Service today presents the 2013 Operating Budget Estimates of the Police Services Board. On behalf of Deputy Leendertz, Deputy Gert, and myself, we would like to acknowledge the contribution of all of our members in the development of the 2013 Budget Estimates. This is a budget that is built on maintaining a focus on frontline delivery of service in the community. We have used historical trend analysis, zero-based justifications, peer review, senior officer oversight, and finally, command oversight. Today, this board will deliberate the budget estimates. From 2010 to 2012, the staff of the Hamilton Police Service have been working hard to deliver on the board's business plan. This business plan was built in concert with our community. And the command team is very proud of the members of this police service that deliver excellence in policing every day. And we particularly want to recognize those that have worked on this budget submission, which clearly supports our commitment to public safety and our ongoing efforts to keep Hamiltonians safe. A safety delivered by our frontline civilian and sworn members. The actual need of the Hamilton Police Service, as identified through a very thorough budget process, is 6.28% in the amount of $8.5 million. The actual need does not move the staffing model previously presented to this board to the required 60% reactive and 40% proactive levels that will ensure that we are able to achieve the response time standards that have been established in the city. I will have more details on that shortly when I address the staffing issues. I will note that this board has previously asked the service to review the service efficiency reviews pertaining to policing that were completed by KPMG and Ernst & Young, and we did look at those performance indicators and recommendations. It is important to note that the Ernst & Young report made full recommendation to adopt a staffing model of 60% reactive and 40% proactive time in the policing report. This, in fact, is the same finding that was advanced by the Hamilton Police Service in, in 2011 through our seven-year strategic staffing plan. The actual need of 6.28%, $8.5 million, includes increase of staff of 27 for frontline delivery of service and a civilian. I remind you that that is in fact the actual need for 2013. Our staff have strategized through multiple scenarios for consideration. We have assessed and prioritized our facilities, our equipment, our staffing needs in light of the direction of City Council, the economic indicators in our current environment, 
and our desire as a service to provide effective and efficient delivery of policing services within our community. Our strategic business approach remains on track and we have moved logically through the phases of organizational structural change, focusing on our business strategies, and we continue to focus on skills development and business systems components as we move towards our vision of the future. We remain committed in our focus and we have prioritized our efforts focused on our people, policy, training, supervision, and our accountability measures. We have undergone restructuring in 2010. We created community mobilization. We created professional development, risk management, and the SIU liaison position. The benefits of those changes are paying off in risk reduction, officer safety enhancement, and liability reductions for our service. Over 40 policies have been upgraded in 2011 and an additional 55 policies upgraded in 2012. And we are working to ensure that our policies are current, that they are based in best practice, and that they provide clear direction to all of our members. Our goal is to maintain the safety and security of our city and to ensure that we are as safe tomorrow as we are today. We have worked in support of the city departments, like economic development, in their bid to bring business to Hamilton because we know that public safety is paramount in attracting and retaining the families that choose to settle and raise their kids in our city as we strive to be the best place to raise a child. In 2011, our management staff completed a very strategic, evidence-based work that has greatly assisted us in assessing our current state with a focus towards long-term planning. We have worked to identify gaps in business process and support systems, which in turn impact the delivery of service to all of our citizens. We have analyzed Statistics Canada data related to crime rates and to crime severity. We have looked at the Ontario Municipal Board data related to population, growth, staffing, and service delivery. We have completed the second five-year workload analysis. We have researched our deployment models for seven-year strategic staffing decisions. We have completed a pilot project focused on business process re-engineering, and we created the case preparation unit which meets our business need and objective to reduce time that is spent by our officers on the administrative functions. The Hamilton Police Service has maximized efficiency of current staff, but we can no longer absorb additional demands. The 2013 demands for policing in Hamilton require an increase of 45 officers and 16 civilian support staff for 2013. And the long-term vision of the service is to grow with our community with an additional 140 personnel by 2018. Given all of the considerations just outlined, our staff have in fact been able to restrict the 2013 budget need to our final request of the city from 6.28 million, 6.28% or 8.5 million to 5.25% or $7.1 million. Last year, the Hamilton Police Service advanced the lowest budget request of the service in the last 10 years at 3.37. We are unable to meet that similar goal this year. The city request of zero would mean that 86 officers would be eliminated from our service. If you remove the contractual obligations contained in the collective agreement that is negotiated between the board and the senior and junior police associations, the Hamilton Police Service request for a budget increase in 2013 is 1.59. The Hamilton Police Service requires a total of 61 new staff members. We have completed the seven-year strategic staffing plan, and as a service, we adopted the 60-40 model for deployment targets. And I would remind you that that is 60% of our frontline officers' time that is to be spent on reactive calls for service and 40% of their time on proactive issues addressing community concerns. 
In a recent review of policing in the province of Ontario completed by Ernst & Young in 2012, as I mentioned a moment ago, they made recommendations to adopt the 60-40 model, and it is noteworthy that the Hamilton Police Service made their commitment to this position in advance of that report. Throughout 2010 and 2011, and to date, the Hamilton Police Service have focused on maximizing of resources and business processes to support the frontline delivery of service. We have undertaken the case preparation unit to reduce administrative time, and in fact, we have reduced that time, the average from four hours and 17 minutes in the preparation of a Crown package to one hour and four minutes. We have commenced the enterprise resource planning process to chart the course for electronic scheduling for time and attendance management, and we have put in place a crime analysis coordinator to undertake a gap analysis in database and software support for the strategic analysis of citywide crime. We have completed a shift schedule alteration, and we, have, we anticipate that that will be put in place in January, and our anticipation is it will have a significant impact on the calls for service and our response times. And we currently are reviewing court staffing, which is ongoing because our increases in cases have taken place before the courts and we are in experiencing increased prisoner volumes. What we have been doing for the last three years is in fact seeding innovation to expand our capabilities. While those projects continue to produce important service improvements, the current staffing model percentage sits at 65% reactive and 35% proactive. In order for us to maintain for tomorrow where we are in fact today, the service would require 29 officers. The actual staffing request for 2013 has been finalized at 21. The focus is putting more officers on the street for frontline public safety to support our current education, prevention and enforcement efforts. Our strategy is working. And the dividend produced by our service is not only significantly reducing the crime rates, but also supporting the city's goals to enhance economic growth and vitality. We will now review some of the details of this request. I would remind the board of the ongoing work and the reports previously discussed, which show a spectrum of analysis that continue to help the service to drive advances in public safety while recognizing a holistic business approach that we have taken. Workload analysis has been completed, looking at our response times, our beat distribution by work, productivity, our reactive and proactive time. We have looked at cost containment and we have taken initiatives initiatives like the HVAC replacement in Division 1 and our vehicle life cycle program. We have generated revenue through the amendments to the records retention schedule and the fees that are associated and were approved by this board with respect to towing, pay duties and administrative fees. And we have completed the seven year staffing strategic forecast in 2011, as I mentioned earlier, and our business plan survey was completed. And all of that work was done amidst the backdrop of diminishing provincial and federal funding. To help ourselves with these challenges, we have in fact in 2010 restructured and realigned the organization with the approval of this board. In 2011, completed a multi-level strategic review. We presented the 2012 budget request, which I remind you was the lowest request in 10 years. And we went through these ex exhaustive reviews that are listed here. And I would add to the ones that I've already mentioned, the computer services redesign, the emotionally disturbed persons protocol with St. Joe's, and the introduction of the social navigator program fully supported by the city of Hamilton. Contained within the 4.84 is the new complement of staff at 1.22% or $1.6 million. The building of the 2013 budget are in the building of the budget our collective bargaining agreement pressures as negotiated by the board are in fact 3.62%. Without the service budgeting for one net new item 
our starting point to create this budget is in fact 3.62. The 4.84 or six and a half million dollar pressure comes from salary, benefits, and OMERS that are negotiated within the collective agreement and combined with the 1.18% required for the staffing increase. OMERS is a significant increase assigned to all OMERS participants and it is not under our control. It is not subject to local intervention. The collective agreements of this board expire with the associations at the end of 2012. 88% of the police budget is salary and benefits, leaving 12% for service delivery maintenance. 0.45% or $604,000 is identified for operational continuity expenditures. The Hamilton Police Service is responsible in law to provide crime prevention, law enforcement, assistance to victims, public order maintenance, and emergency response. And the city is responsible in law to provide the infrastructure, the equipment, the facilities, the vehicles in support of the policing efforts. The Hamilton Police Service continues to deliver excellence in policing and are producing substantial amounts of work that contribute to the safety of our public. In totality, there are 10,000 less people that are victimized by criminal incidents in our city today than there were in 2002. Public safety is the product of excellent policing, and we do things that other agencies do not and are not able to do. We celebrate the 10-year reductions, and we commend all of our officers for the dramatic increase in criminal charges that are being laid. And with the increase, identified here of over 400 in each of the last two years. So how are we in fact doing? Positive decreases are shown in the crime trends over the last 10 years. This is due in part to the adherence to the strict concepts of community-based policing and those programs including in the history of this service, COP 2000, Divisional Crime Managers, neighborhood safety project, and now enhanced through the action strategy. What do the rates mean in terms of real people? In 2010, at least 28,365 people were the victims of crime, and that was reduced in 2011 by 2,092. This is very significant. 2,092 people in our city were not the victims of a violent crime. And it is at, in fact, a seven year low at 6,284. We also know that this is actually only reported crime. We continue our educational efforts to increase reporting, but in fact, we all know we have a long way to go, particularly on the issues of domestic violence and sexual assault. These statistics are supported in the Stats Canada reports and again at the Ontario Municipal Benchmarking data. In Canada, of the 14 cities with populations over 500,000, Hamilton is the fifth highest in violent crime. While our Hamilton trends are downward and going in the right direction, Hamilton continues to face certain challenge. Of the Big 12 Ontario cities, Hamilton is the fifth highest in incidence of property crime, the third highest in violent crime severity or the seriousness of crime, and we are the second highest in incidence of violent crime. So in fact, we need to be doing more. And it is interesting to observe that London, Niagara, Ottawa, Sudbury, Thunder Bay, Toronto, and Windsor all have higher levels of policing ratios. That's more police officers in their communities than we have in Hamilton. And all of them, except Thunder Bay, in fact have a lower violent crime rate. It is our position that more officers, highly visible on the front line, has a direct impact on preventing and eliminating violent crime. 
There was a dramatic increase in violent crime severity from 2004 to 2007. With the full consent, approval, and support of the board, the Hamilton Police undertook a citywide implementation of the Neighborhood Safety Project in 2006. We added the crime managers process and we supplemented the, with a focus on drugs, gangs, and weapons through the integrated guns and gang strategy and the Hamilton Guns and Weapons Enforcement Team. And the result, three years of increased severity of violence was abated. Three years of increased severity in violence was abated. We know that our strategy and our focus on offender management is correct. We also know that Council has supported this service historically with appropriate levels of funding. In 2007, there were multiple shootings in this city. Our response, we had to shut down a homicide team and start a shooting team. We infused 22 officers in 2007 and they produced immediate results that we have continued to improve upon. While our patrol calls for service remain relatively stable at 85,000 per year, and the distribution of calls as man mandated in the priority response system, our policy, they remain equitably distributed over time. The time that is required to complete those 85,000 calls for service has changed dramatically by 36,000 hours. And for some perspective, that is equivalent to 21 police officers that are required to do that additional 36,000 hours of work. And we did not hire 21 officers over the last four years. So our commitment to continuous business process improvement over the last four years has resulted in a cost avoidance of $6.4 million. However, we are saturated and we can no longer support this level of service delivery. Our staffing has not increased proportionate to the additional hours of work that are required. The impact of the action strategy in 2010 on the reduction in robberies is very significant. The reductions in priority zero calls is at the lowest level in six years and the reduced incidents of violence continue to be positive. What is also very important in terms of resource consumption is the increasing number of festivals and demonstrations. We are able to deploy our action teams and we do our very best not to divert resources from the divisions as they are required to maintain operational continuity. So how are we doing on the issue of enhancing personal and public safety? We are seeing an increase in the arrest numbers for the service over the past three years. This equates to more criminal cases, more crown packages, more prisoner management incidents, and no doubt this adds to the ongoing decrease in overall crime. However, there are in fact additional expenses with the overtime and court time requirements to prosecute those cases. And we continue to hold the public trust with approximately 80% of the people feeling safe in our downtown area. The 12-year staffing of the service is presented here with the grant-funded officers included. If we remove the 67 grant officers currently approved, our staffing levels remain at 2007 level, and I remind you that our time on calls has increased in the last five years by 36,000 hours, as I have just mentioned. Also, there has been essentially no civilian expansion in our organization to support the frontline delivery of policing services. The Hamilton Police are in fact a very lean organization and with increased demand we are saturated. The Canadian average of criminal incidents handled by every police officer is 30. The Ontario average is 30 and in Hamilton the average is 35 and recent stats have advanced that to 38. We are the third highest of the Big 12 policing agencies. We are in fact producing more work per officer and that is value for the money that is invested in policing. Analyzing Statistics Canada data, for Hamilton to move to the provincial average, we would need to hire 220 officers. 
Of the Canadian cities with populations over 500,000, we are the seventh lowest in ratio of officers to population, and of the six Ontario cities with populations over 500,000, Hamilton has the third highest crime severity index. So more work is getting done with less, and much of our work that we do is in fact unseen. Thefts remain stable at about 12,000 per year, as do the offences of failing to comply and fail to appear. In 2011, it was the highest number of impaired drivers ever arrested on our streets in the last 15 years, and we are on track this year to surpass last year's record. Note here the dramatic increase in drug offences with increases of over 400 cases in each of the last two years and we anticipate greater enforcement this year will lead to over 2,000 cases. Fraud remains a critical issue in our community. With institutional fraud, fraud against charitable organizations and fraud related to seniors, we do not have the sufficient number of fraud investigators that we require. Child pornography cases. The numbers are in fact quite low, but investigations are extremely complex, and the average cases contain over a million images for review, catalog, and determination, and we draw resources from other areas of the service to supplement larger, more complex cases. We are on track to complete 700 death investigations this year. Our missing persons remain relatively stable at 2,400, and although we have a new procedure with St. Joe's that is very significantly reducing patient wait times, we are witnessing an increased number of apprehensions under the Mental Health Act, and a full report regarding this issue will be presented to the board in December. The demand for policing service continues to be at the highest levels. Our 911 emergency calls continue. They continue to rise the last year from 15,000 to 18,000, and the same pattern is evident over the last 24 months. The computer-aided design or CAD calls for service events show the same increase to match increasing demand for a police response, and we track the times that a call for service must wait in pending because there is no unit available. No unit available situations generally occur between 20 and 40 times per month and rise dr dramatically in the summer months at a time when our call volume is also in fact at its highest. However, when there is a priority zero call that involves imminent death or bodily harm situations, our officers drop absolutely everything and we go and we attend to these circumstances. The City of Hamilton is doing very well, doing very well on the issuance of building permits supporting growth. This venture is, is both diversifying and expanding the tax base. The Real Estate Investment Network cited Hamilton as the number one place to invest. People will invest, they will move to, they will work in Hamilton because we are producing a safe city. The Hamilton Police Service is committed to public safety and providing excellence in policing and doing so in the most cost-effective manner. We are working diligently to reduce the incidence of impaired driving that take place on our streets through education and enforcement. And as I mentioned, we have seen the highest number of impaired arrests in the last 15 years last year. We are, we are outpacing that this year. And we are also outstripping the number of ride stops that have ever been completed in our history. We have reduced our citizens' involved collisions from 8,468 as of October 2009 to a low of 7,302 in October of 2012. That is a year-to-date reduction of 1,166 collisions. That's 1,166 people that didn't crash, that did not get injured, that did not go to hospital, that did not have an insurance claim, and that is a 13.8% reduction. Since October of 2009, our provincial offense notice ticket enforcement is up dramatically by 37% to 66,000 as of October 31st of this year. And I just received word today, about an hour ago from the provincial offenses office, that the Hamilton Police Service now have issued the most 
uh, were third in the province for the issuance of tickets, all in an effort to keep our drivers, pedestrians, and cyclists safe. And we will continue to enforce the law. But the citizens need to remember that compliance with the law is in fact free and in com compliance is actually safer. Chair and members of the board, in support of the effective and efficient delivery of service to our community, the Hamilton Police Service makes recommendation that this board receive, review, and approve the 2013 operating budget request as presented. And at this time, I would ask Deputy Gert, Deputy Leanderts, and Ted Mason to make themselves available with me to answer any of your questions. Thank you, Chief. Any questions? Uh, a couple of uh, great presentations, Chief, as always. Uh, uh, certainly provides uh, a lot of um, information for people to, uh, to absorb and appreciate in regards to uh, what I believe is one of the best police services in Canada. The, uh, I guess I've got a number of questions. First of all, what you don't identify here is you've got a number of reserves. You have vehicle reserve, you have sick leave reserve, you have a number of reserves that you keep throwing money into, but you're really not drawing from. So I'm wondering, uh, have we reviewed the, uh, all the reserves that the police services currently uh, have, and what are we doing in those areas where we continue uh, adding but not taking anything from? Through you, Madam Chair. Um, yes, we certainly have, uh, every year we go through this process and we do uh, look at, at the reserves and, uh, and what money can come from the reserves. Um, <clears throat> as um, the last number of years, what we've had uh, is we've had a tax stabilization reserve and we've had uh, 150,000 coming out of that tax stabilization reserve every year. And, uh, and this year, if for the uh, estimate again for 2013 is again $150,000 there. As well, we do have, as you've said, we have our, our capital reserve. And our capital reserve, we had, um, we've certainly used, uh, been uh, using that reserve for our uh, facilities needs over the last couple of years. We've used uh, 800,000 came out in, the t in 2011 for the uh, uh, furniture and equipment for the uh, uh, multi-agency uh, training facility. And uh, this year, um, we're also, as in, again, 2012 budget, we had uh, 250,000 come into as revenue into this budget. Again, we're trying to, because our capital reserve is starting to decrease, we're trying to phase out that contribution to the, um, to the budget. And so this year, instead of having 250, we've got 225 coming out. And, we, and uh, similar to that, uh, the vehicle reserve, as you say, we, we do have a vehicle reserve. And we've been using that vehicle reserve in a similar fashion to help offset um, increases to the budget. So if, uh, if you so go in... Can I just interrupt for a second? On the vehicle reserve, my, uh, the last uh, quick look I had, we haven't been drawing from that for three, four years. Actually, actually it has been. If, if you look on Appendix D, uh, the first page of Appendix D, and it'll show money coming out of the of the vehicle reserve. So that's something that we've been we've been using over the last number of years to mitigate um, the impact on our uh, um, on on the budget. So on on page as I said, page one, appendix D, we've got uh, under revenues, we've got a number of the you know provincial grants, and then we come down to capital reserve. Uh, in 2012, 250 down to 225, and then the vehicle reserve 150 down to 125. So we have certainly been using those reserves to help offset the uh, increases in our budget. Okay, appreciate that clarity. And, and uh, uh, as well, right at the bottom there, the police tax stabilization reserve. Um, it's right uh, under or uh, right above the uh, total budget numbers. You can see 150 and 150. And that's, uh, that tax stabilization reserve has been drawn down over the years. Now we've got, uh, at the end of 2013, we'll probably have in the neighborhood 
of $300,000 in there, so we'll have two more years of, of uh, contributions from that reserve to help out our, our budget. So, On the same page, you have the firearms at a 22% increase in, I guess, that revenue? That, that's correct. So can, is that, that's a reserve? No, that's uh, uh, the firearms, that's the chief firearms. It's, a, it's a, like a secondment. Okay. And so um, that went to the board uh, earlier this year. Um, the uh, province is, is providing more funding for that, which is uh, certainly an advantage to us. Appreciate that. Uh, in the uh, presentation that uh, we received in our board packages, uh, they had the ONBI population uh, gross between 2000 uh, seven in 2012. This is the information we're relying on in regards to our per hundred thousand staffing. Yeah, we've used we've used the OMBI data. We have looked at Stats Canada data as well. And, and we have used that in the preparation of the uh, ratios that you've seen today. Okay, so when I, I look at uh, the Hamilton since 2007 to 2012, uh, it's indicating there's been uh, a 12,000 increase in population, 12,876 uh, population increase. That, that would be your uh, understanding? Well, we also compared that against the uh, the city's data, and what uh, the city has advanced is uh, a population of uh, 519, and it, that works out to about an increase of 14,000. And when you apply the ratios of policing that has been established in the city over a period of years, which is 1.53 officers per thousand, the uh, the increase, which has predominantly been in the uh, in the Binbrook area. Uh, would indicate that 22 officers are required to police that amount of people that has been increased in the population base. But this is our information I have in, before me. Uh, it, it suggests that the population in of 2011, 12 is, uh, I believe it was 531,000. Yeah, th the OMBI report says 531,000. But the city has issued a directive that uh, agencies, boards, commissions, and division will use the population of 519,000. So although we make reference to the OMBI data, it is compared in, in, in contrast to what the city has said is the population at 519. Okay, so then if I understand that to be accurate in regards to today's population, when I go back to 2007, is the ONBI uh, number still uh, accurate, or is there uh, another number that we should use to determine the, the actual growth between 2007 and 2012? Yeah, I, we did not go back and, and look at the uh, ONBI ratios in relation to population and officer ratios for 2007 and advance those. Okay. So uh, when I use the ONBI uh, numbers, it's actually 12,836. That's from 2007 to, uh, to 2012. Mm -hmm. I've, I've been told now that the actual population is around 519,000. So actually, this is based on a 531,000 population. So the actual growth was actually, would be smaller than what's indicated on this page. Yeah. The, growth, uh, the growth that we are identifying and relying upon is the city-issued statistic of 519,000. Okay, I just trying to determine, Chief, uh, the, the growth since 2000. I think it's significant because the comparisons I want to uh, 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 make, I want to make sure I'm, I'm, I'm working with the right base. Mm -hmm. So that's why I'm spending a little time on understanding the actual population differential between uh, growth since 2007 to 2012, because I will be asking questions in regards to uh, communities like Halton and, and, and others that had significant growth well beyond ours. But I want to make sure that, you know, the benchmarking in regards to Hamilton, there's consensus on. So we're looking at 12,000 growth based on the ONBI uh, information. It's the best information we have in front of us now. That and the city's, uh, the city's population growth is uh, earmarked at 14,000. So okay. we're in the right area. Appreciate that. Um, Council, is that another question? Because we do have members of the board, other members of the board who have first time questions. Well, Madam Chair, uh, if you want to uh, have a different budget process, because I got lots of questions on the okay. budget, I'm sure the public like to hear those questions asked and you as will, well. You will be. I, I will give up the floor. No question. I only asked three questions so far. I just wanted to get okay. clarity. But if yes. you want to move this along, I'll, I'll, I'll yes. reserve. I'll wait till everyone finishes their questions. Right. Now I'll ask yeah. probably a, half, a, more than a dozen yeah. at least. Thank you, Mayor. You have a question. Uh, thanks, Madam Chair. 
Chief, um, on the seven-year strategic staffing plan, what is the outcome in the seventh year? What, how, how will it progress through this, the seven years? The progression of the plan uh, would indicate that in uh, 2012, uh, we would require a staff of 61, that's 45 officers and 16 civilians. And that would progress up to 2018, where the proposed staff uh, would increase in totality uh, to uh, 100, uh, 103 sworn and 37 civilians, a total of 140 by that date. And in terms of the ratio, what would it be by the 2018? Uh, that is based on a commitment of this service with the forecasts in increased demand and population and growth. And again, those are for forecast and conservative uh, estimates. That would be to maintain our commitment to a 40% proactive and 60% reactive model. I see. Chief, the... Uh I think all, all of us on the board are, are really proud of the police service and proud to serve on the board. And the numbers are quite uh, informative, to say the least. And I think the, the issue for us uh, as the board in dealing with the budget is that we have access to more information. Uh, we uh, tend to understand uh, the demands on policing, whereas the public will be confronted with a number, and they'll see a, a 7 million or a 5.25 percent or, or whatever they see, and, and there will be, a, through you, Madam Chair, complaints about that number because it's taken, in a sense, in, in my opinion, as the mayor, slightly out of context in terms of the information that we have, the uh, OMBI comparators, the growth um, or, or the improvement, I would say, in the, in, in the police service responses to the various issues that the community faces. And one of the things that I recall, uh, Madam Chair, when uh, Chief first uh, took over was the, uh, you made a, a comment, Chief DeCare, about public disorder and the fact that you wanted to see uh, that, that you would, as the chief of this uh, city's uh, police department, address that in, in strenuous ways. And so what's your feeling? Uh, we saw the numbers, but just from uh, when, when talking to the public, without getting into too, mu too many statistical details, what would you say as the chief? has been the effect of the policing over the past couple of years in terms of the phrase that you use, public disorder, mm -hmm. and the other issues that you are confronted with as a chief? The position of this service has been for a great many years, uh, research at least going back to the reports on COP2000, a commitment to public safety and improvement of the quality of life of our citizens and with the focus and the change that has been driven by this board and by this service over over the years since 2000 uh, we've put in place the core patrol we have grown the core patrol into the uh, into the action strategy we have put in place the crime managers we have put in place permanent beat assignments and we are very well served in this community by individuals like Gary David and Dale Neal uh, on their beat assignments on James Street and Barton Street uh, we have done a lot of research uh, in this service. May of 2008, the search report, the search report, substance use related crime in Hamilton. Uh, that report is very clear. And what that report tells us is that of those that commit the offenses of robberies, we know that 58% of those that rob a, f a financial institution have a drug conviction, 38% that rob a commercial retail outlet have a drug conviction, 43% that commit a home invasion have a drug conviction. We know that we have a lot of work to do at the street level. 
But what has happened in the last three years is our commitment to looking after that street disorder in concert with the city has dramatically changed. We have put in place the social navigator program, which is much more uh, efficient in dealing proactively with issues that confront people, alcohol addiction, drug addiction, mental health issues. Not everybody that is able to be arrested should be arrested, and not everybody that, that ends up in the cells in custody should be in custody. And we're working much closer with our social agencies and partner with Paul Johnson here at the city, funded by, uh, funded by Glenn Norton, and working with the city departments to make sure that we address that crime and disorder for our businesses, for our economic development, to make sure that people are investing in the downtown, that they are coming downtown, going to the restaurants, that they are setting up their businesses, and we are seeing a dramatic change in just the amount of development that is taking place. And this is not only in the downtown core. The officers working on these strategies can go anywhere in the city. I'm going to spend considerable amount of time in the East End and on Concession Street. So to, to answer your question, Mr. Mayor, we are seeing a very significant improvement in public safety, and we are looking after those crimes of disorder. Thanks, Chief. And I'll finish, uh, Madam Chair, uh, with uh, the comment that I think it's incumbent upon us as board members to to try to get the story of of the of policing in Hamilton, such as you you've outlined it, and why the rationale behind what we have before us. And we, we need to take the conversation away from a number. Uh, in terms of the numbers that we have, I can say that it would be approximately 1% uh, uh, of our tax, uh, when you apply it to our total budget, is about 6 point something million, which on an average household is about $30. And so what you're, the, average householder is confronted with is do you feel that uh, more policing will be better I've never heard anyone for instance madam chair say you know there's way too many officers I, I've never heard anyone say there's too much policing what we have I believe with the description that the chief gave us is how good our policing is but the public still needs to have a broad understanding and I would even offer that perhaps council uh, needs to uh, look at some of the information that we have. And so what I would say, um, and finally, Councillor um, Councillor Whitehead obviously has lots of more questions himself, and I think that I probably would like to drill into some of the things that he has in terms of reserves and so on. So for what I would suggest is that um, when, at the appropriate time I would receive uh, the report and refer back to the board, and in the meantime, uh, do the uh, the piece with the public and with our uh, colleagues on council, so that uh, we don't simply confront the situation uh, with a headline tomorrow that says all this more money for policing. I think we'd have to do a little bit of education for ourselves, for our colleagues, and for the public. So that would be my recommendation at the appropriate time, and I'll relinquish the floor. Thank you. Through you, Madam Chair, to uh, the Chief, if I may ask a question. Uh, can you describe um, the, the real impact for me of the, you know, where the, on the street, that's the boots on the street that we can expect by adding these uh, 20 additional uh, sworn officers? I'm really just trying to get a, a, a visual on how many additional police patrolling per shift uh, on any given day or night that we can expect. We have this broad number of 20, and folks are probably anticipating that 20 at a time are out there. And if you can enlighten me, please. Uh, that's an excellent question in terms of deployment of the additional positions, and the command have met. We have reviewed the workload analysis over 10 years. We have looked at the assignment of beats. We have looked at the distribution of work within those beats, the sectors, and within a division. Uh, I will tell you uh, um, that the work that was done by this service in excess of 10 years ago with the beat realignments continues to be a very valid model today. And uh, when we talk about um, putting officers on the street in a 24-7 operation, given uh, that we operate in a four-shift system, 
and that we have uh, what are referred detractors uh, from their actual deployment. Annual leave, sick, maternity, paternity, uh, WSIB, injured on duty, training, court, all of those things that factor into the life of a police officer. Our shift relief factor runs at, a, at about uh, two and a half per person. So uh, the, the easiest way to, to remember that is it takes about seven officers to fill a full-time position 24 hours a day to get an individual physically on the street. Uh, we have met and we have discussed where these officers will go. Uh, we will be assigning uh, uh, the 20 officers, if approved, to uh, the frontline divisional patrol in Division 2, to the frontline divisional patrol in Division 3 in a sector support model. We will be assigning uh, individuals to the central breath unit. As you've heard, the impaired driving continues to be on a, a very significant increase in this city. And we will also uh, have joint responsibilities for those officers in traffic enforcement. Uh, on the investigative side, we have significant risk, and issue, risk issues and liability issues ar around, and we will support uh, the investigations of missing persons, sex offender registries, fugitive apprehension, technical crime support, uh, our polygraph examiner, and the internet child exploitation section is where those officers will be deployed. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Chief, thanks for the presentation and uh, to the crew that, that, that put it together. Uh, I'm going to cut to the chase a little bit. I think, uh, you know, I, I, my first question, really broad question would be, uh, is there a plan to take this budget on the road? And, and for the public uh, would be my, my question through you, Madam Chair, to, to the Chief. Uh, there is uh, going to unfold the same strategy that was uh, uh, developed and designed in concert with the, uh, with the uh, board last year. Uh, we have started that through the publication of the uh, budget documents and that online. Uh, we will be meeting with our community partners to discuss this, keeping in mind that the the business, pro, uh, the business planning process just uh, completed for our service where, uh, where a couple hundred people in the community came together to help us to design our business plan. We consider those to be uh, important partners as we go forward and our efforts will be spent. Uh, we appear before council on January the 24th to present the service, uh, the board's budget. Uh, between now and then we will be taking this uh, to get it uh, exposed to our uh, community partners. Madam Chair, uh, I, I did, uh, you know, I'm familiar with much of this and certainly the rationale behind it and certainly uh, have always been supportive and, and, and know a number of the areas, uh, uh, but much along the lines of, of what the, uh, the uh, mayor is talking about uh, and given what the chief just said, I mean, the mayor mentioned that there, there's a potential for complaints. Let me assure you there's already, there are complaints uh, if you check with our emails to just today and over the weekend and phone calls, I think the public needs to, to get a fuller picture. Uh, Chief, I need to share this with you too, uh, as much as I understand it all and, and relate to it. Um, this, the 5%, you know, given our environmental circumstance, just doesn't fly very well given the budget pressures we're on under as a council. And, and I think I need to put that on the table because uh, I would certainly, and I had discussions with the chief, uh, with the, chief, with the mayor, and, and certainly my colleague, uh, Councillor Whitehead, today, saying that I, I was in a position only really to receive this tonight, certainly to review it further, and certainly not to approve it. Uh, I couldn't. Uh, and coming from me, it's only because, you know, when you look in our community and you look across the country and you, you, you watch everything from our, our, our local media to our national media to the, the international media where fiscal cliffs are occurring. and. As much as we, we, you know, what I really have appreciated at the police service is that we've been really well organized, really focused, and we're, and, and, I, and I still maintain that. But the bottom line is, I guess, if from a corporate perspective, I have to say to you, you Madam Chair, through to the Chief and to, to the great team that I've worked for for so long, 5.25 right now doesn't fly. And it doesn't fly because... It, 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 of the pressures that we're looking at, I mean, I, I know as we move towards budgets just to hear, today alone, there's some very critical uh, items that we're, we're looking at that we're just putting in abeyance to the, to the budget cycle. And, and, and quite frankly, uh, a number of us today 
inside know we want to accomplish these things and want to approve them today at, at the GIC, but we just wouldn't do that because we want to see the total picture. So uh, in addition to the fact that I, I, I think we need to allow the public um, an opportunity to go through the process, I, I know the good chief and, and staff will be coming in to see uh, just the councillors alone and, and, and as well as we've taken it on the road, um, some of the very people that that have used this service the most sometimes complain the most about the, uh, the, the cost. But the bottom line is we need to go through that process. So uh, I certainly uh, need to send the message across the table that uh, I'm very uncomfortable with the 5.25. The best I can come up with tonight is to say to you that I would certainly delay that. I will not approve it tonight and subject to uh, carrying out further uh, um, communiques with the public and certainly, uh, you know, um, going through the process, Chief, of, of visiting the various uh, agencies that you have in the past to explain in detail and, uh, in essence, sell this budget at whatever level. But I, if, I was, if I was sitting in a corporate room right now, I would probably have to say to you, Madam Chair, through you, um, that uh, please go away and take another look at this. And I'm not talking about a 0% increase. I think that that's totally unreasonable. And I know we, we talked about 60R, 40R, now we're 65R, 35P, uh, uh, whatever, and down to a total of 21. Uh, maybe that's where the variability's got to come. I mean, when, when you can come out there today and say we're going to hire 20 new, and I, you, I feel strong, so strongly about this service and what it does. I'm just telling you that's a very tough comment to make in, in this economic environment across the board. You know, you got people like your neighbors that are working at the various industries and the various organizations. Everybody is cutting back, and, um, and we know we need 20 more at a minimum, at a minimum. And I think that needs to be shook out a little bit in more detail. And uh, so today I'd be more than happy to, uh, Madam Chair, if the mayor is going to make that motion to receive and to, to proceed with the uh, further uh, review and, and expo to the, uh, to the citizens and, and those other people that we have consulted with in the past, uh, I would be more than pleased to second that motion to move it forward and to, um, in the spirit of, of hearing these comments and going back on a very corporate basis and seeing if we can do more. Thank you. I actually uh, appreciate that Councillor Morelli uh, did talk to me uh, um, during the GIC and indicated that uh, it was his hope that uh, at the very least, uh, uh, at the very most, we receive it uh, and then uh, and, and send it back and, and, and do the public consultation and so forth. So I think that is important. I do support that direction. I, I want to make sure, though, when we go out and, and educate the public, that, that the numbers we're dealing with here are modified, legitimate, or telling the right story. And so when I get into the, the, the population numbers, it's important because when you look at the first page of the, the presentation, it gives a stat in regards to uh, um, the cumulative budget since 2007-2012. It says that the average increases has been 30 uh, percent, 3.83 percent. In Hamilton, it was 23.73 percent. What it doesn't say that the majority of the, uh, uh, the communities that increased that average significantly, we're going through huge growth. 102,000 in New York, they came in at 43 percent. Uh, 40,000 in Alton, 63,000 in Peel. So I just want to make it clear that it's great to throw numbers up, but if you don't have the context, then you believe, well, hey, Hamilton is doing okay. Well, if you start adjusting those numbers, in fact, Hamilton is right there in regards to being uh, a fairly significant cumulative impact on the city of Hamilton relative to the, uh, the budgets. So I want to make sure there's an understanding of what these numbers represent and what they say. The other concern I have, I guess, is uh, the, the chief had mentioned in his report that uh, there's 7,000 packages or crown packages that have to be prepared because of 7,000 arrests. I need to get a clear understanding of the process. I thought arrest, you can release charges, crown packages, and then there's certainly the conviction rate. We don't have the conviction rates here. They're missing. We don't have the, the, the charges. Uh, they're missing. 
but we do have a rest, and we know that rest could be as simple as a t providing a ticket, I believe, to a POI, a, was it a POA, Provincial Offense Act, when somebody may have a, a joint in their hand or, or something along those lines. So I need to distinguish exactly where uh, the extra efforts are, where, where the police and where it's impacting on the police when you talk about rest versus charges versus uh, going through the whole process. Because when you get convictions, you know you're tying up your, uh, your police officers in the courts. And that tells a story in itself. And I don't think that story is being fully told in these presentations. So can I just ask the Chief to comment on that? Well, let's deal, uh, first of all, with the conviction rate. Uh, so our officers go out and they arrest one individual and they charge with uh, 10 criminal offenses associated to an incident that takes place. That matter is prepared in its entirety, requiring all matters of disclosure that have to go forward to the court. And the Crown Attorney, in their rightful, appropriate, lawful uh, abilities, makes a decision to accept a plea to one charge of whatever, robbery. So our conviction rate would be 10%. So you would rely upon the conviction rate for the case. Well, the case has absolutely nothing to do with the conviction rate. That's completely out of our jurisdiction. It's within the Crown, Crown's authority and it's within the Crown's hands. So we have to be careful, as you have indicated, to make sure that the stories in, uh, that are told from the numbers are in fact accurate. So when you would see a 10% conviction rate in that case, it's not, it's not accurate at all because all of the same investigative steps that are required to put the matter before the court must still take place. And the paperwork has to be done on every case. So what we have done is we've centralized this in order to get our officers out. Our officers are doing their notes, they're doing their statements, they're scanning them in, and they're getting back out on the road so that they're available for calls for service so that we can address our response time standards. We have the central unit that is preparing all of the documents and all of the paperwork. And in fact, by moving to a centralized unit, we are getting economies of scale because they get much better at producing the paperwork and they know exactly what is required and they're faster at it. So we're gaining efficiencies uh, in, in dealing with those things like the, like the cases. So charges, conviction rate, all of those things, we have to be careful because the same amount of paperwork and, and investigation is required at the front end. Uh, the measure at the back end, whether it be a conviction rate or a clearance rate, is not is not necessarily telling the whole story. I, I appreciate that, Chief. That's I mean the same argument can be made about unemployment rates. I mean it's not next, necessarily an accurate reflection of how many people are out of work, but it, nevertheless it's a measurement. And if you don't have that measurement, then you have no way to, to benchmark it, uh, regardless, because all things being equal, that's the only measurement you have. So I'm wondering, do we have the the, 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 the amount of charges actually uh, that arrived or came out of the uh, in the last year, for example? Yeah, I don't have the uh, total number of charges. Appreciate it. I just see that as a, yet a, another measurement that we can uh, look at. The other uh, question I have is uh, when I look at, for example, Windsor at 19, uh, cumulative, cumulative 19 percent increase uh, in their, uh, their budget since 2007 to 2012, 19.71, and they have 224 police officers per 100,000. So they have more officers for 100,000 in the city of Hamilton, yet they've been able to uh, come in cumulatively over the same amount of years at a budget of, uh, again, 19.71. And I would uh, and I would draw the board's attention in those in those charts. Uh, if you, Ryan, can you bring those uh, charts up? Go to uh, 2007. What you have before you there is the. Uh, is the percentage increases of the various services, uh, and, and we will see this over a six-year period. Uh, in 2007, Hamilton has the second lowest budget increase of the, I think it's 16 reporting agencies on this chart. 2008, the third lowest. 2009, the second lowest. Uh, 2010, I believe, we're uh, fifth. And 2011, we cl climb up to sixth. And then 2012, which was the lowest budget we requested in 10 years, uh, we came in at, uh, at third. But if you, in those charts that you have provided for you, you'll notice that Toronto and Windsor appear in the last uh, uh, several charts uh, down as the lowest. 
Uh, they, in fact, faced uh, significant different issues than we have faced here in Hamilton. They went through uh, massive restrictions uh, in, in hiring and, and their budgets, and I think that those last two years actually have skewed theirs uh, to put them at the bottom. I think you would see that over the course of the years, uh, Hamilton is, in fact, at the lowest level of all of the reporting agencies over that period of time. And that's quite evident on the last chart, which is before you here, that you'll see Hamilton has, uh, ha is third, it, third lowest in all the increases. And I would agree that the uh, councillor's comments and observations with respect to growth within different regions is an appropriate uh, observation. Many of those jurisdictions uh, have grown at a much quicker rate uh, but also, you'll notice when you look at those that their amount of hires have also increased at a much greater rate. So, uh, for instance, uh, York Region, I believe they are, they are requesting somewhere in the neighbourhood of about 5.1 on a $274 million budget, which equates to them for 39 officers and I think it's 16 civilians. It is a very significantly different picture that presents itself there. Uh, quite happy to uh, always have a look at those things, but, but you're correct. Uh, we need to make sure that we maintain our focus on what is best for Hamilton. I appreciate that, Chief. The, um, so the, uh, the population, I'm going to revisit that, uh, the 12,000, uh, it hasn't grown significantly. Um, so obviously we've been made, able to manage these great results that you uh, put on the screen. Uh, with the current 150 uh, officers per uh, 100,000. Is that correct? No, I disagree with Sorry, that. Sorry, go ahead. Um, we have absorbed and we have done a phenomenal job. And I have to compliment the work of our frontline people that go out there in, and have dedicated their entire adult professional life to the protection of the people of Hamilton. Uh, but we are in very significant... Uh, challenges uh, right now so I, I, I cannot agree with your comment that we have absorbed them and we have done quite well uh, I will identify to for you uh, we've seen significant improvements uh, in the in the collisions and the reductions that I cited to you earlier uh, and in fact from 2003 uh, we had 11,800 collisions in our city we are down uh, to what we anticipate uh, in 2011, it was down to 94.37, a decrease of 2,400 collisions, and we anticipate a significant decrease this year. That's the result of our people out there uh, going and doing an excellent job. However, the pressures that we continue to face, just most recently, a homicide case from 2003 has been committed to a five-week uh, preliminary and continues in 2012 to be a constant and consistent budget pressure for us. Child abuse this year, we have six investigators. The caseload in 2012, year to date, six, sits at 662 cases, which is a 151% increase over 2011. That's over 100 cases per officer, and I'd remind, uh, remind you of the, uh, of the caseload per officer for Hamilton being around 35 to 38 uh, when compared against the OMBI statistics. These officers are carrying over 100 cases uh, and, and that is very significant. With respect to the issue of fraud, right now as of November the 23rd, we have 71 frauds that are sitting waiting for assignment for investigators. We have 94 ODSP frauds reported to us that we do not have investigators to, uh, to handle those cases. In the technical crime area, uh, 2010, we did four investigations. 2011, we did 68. 2012, year to date, we have done 140 technical crime investigations. These people are working and working hard. So absorbing is one, one, one component, but we are not able to do this any longer. With respect to internet child exploitation, one of our recent cases, we seized four terabytes of pornogra pornographic uh, images, including over 1,200 pornographic child videos, and all of that requires a huge commitment of investigators. So I cannot agree with the fact that we are absorbing. We, in fact, are falling behind, and we are unable to keep up. 
Uh, thank you for that. Uh, so we have been managing, maybe is the terminology I should be using, uh, with the current ratio for the last four or five years. That be uh, no, no I can't. I can't. I can't agree with uh, with that. We have the number of people. We are doing the absolute best that we can. But these people uh -huh. are tired. They are working hard. Mm -hmm. We need to. We need to uh, make sure that we include, as is included in this uh, in this budget. Uh, significant support for our people on employee wellness, our employee assistance program. We have seen a recent report of the Ombudsman with respect to the pressures and the stress that our people are under. Uh, so we are doing the work, but we need to do it at a much greater level. Appreciate that, Chief. So you indicated that the KPMG report indicated uh, and then it was supported the target of 6040. Can that be influenced, is that influenced just sheerly by numbers, or can that uh, be influenced by operational decisions? I don't, un I don't understand what you mean. Well, you're, you're indicating uh, and you're justifying uh, the increases uh, b meeting the 60-40 target, reactive and proactive. So I'm trying to understand, uh, can operational decisions within uh, the police services with current uh, uh, resources impact those numbers? Uh, partially, that is possible. Um, if a uh, supervisor told everybody on the road that you're not responding to calls for service today, you're all going to do 100% traffic enforcement, then for that day we would show 100% of the time as proactive doing traffic enforcement. I don't actually see that happening, but certainly it can be influenced by that. However, uh, we, are, uh, we are guided by the priority response system. The priority response system has been in place in the Hamilton Police Service for a great number of years. It is the policy that guides the classification of all calls that enter the Hamilton Police Service. Uh, our call takers, our dispatchers are governed by this policy. Uh, there are three classifications of priority zero calls. There are 42 classifications of priority one calls. There are 37 classifications of priority two calls, 14 classifications of priority three calls, and this goes on right up uh, until uh, classification of priority eight calls. So to be influenced, the statistic to be influenced by an operational decision, the technical answer is yes. The policy guides what is reported to us. It guides what is the response to the, to the call and we handle everything guided by this. This includes, this policy includes, all proactive and all reactive details for appropriate classification across 1,100 employees in the Hamilton Police Service. So um, currently we have the action team, and the action team uh, obviously spends predominantly most of the time in the lower city. The stats bear that out very clearly. Uh, currently, my understanding, there's no flexibility in the context of the, uh, uh, the action team in regards to if there's calls in Division 3 that are surplus uh, to what uh, the capacity of the officers on duty, uh, there's no ability to pull officers from the action team on the mountain. Would that be an operational issue that could be uh, uh, impacting the, the proactive and reactive? Uh, well, first of all, your comments that there is no flexibility in the deployment of the action team to calls uh, that would be taking place in any other part of the city is incorrect. We have always said that our, our supervisors that supervise the action team must work in concert with what is taking place on the street, and I'll give you an example. Most recently, we had a shooting that took place uh, on Barton. And the entire action teams that were uh, working that night were all flooded into that area for the purpose of conducting the investigation, assisting investigators, gathering evidence, doing canvases, checking, uh, checking the area. So uh, there is flexibility with respect to the deployment that can take place, keeping in mind that those officers within the action strategy also deal with a lot of the public issues and public disorder that the mayor was asking about earlier, and they in fact de defer uh, many calls for service by their proactive work. So we do have the flexibility to have those officers respond anywhere uh, in the city and to have them uh, respond to any crime. And, uh, and let's, let's, talk about some of the, uh, let's talk about some of the areas that we have most recently could, used well, them. Just, Ma Madam Chair, I just want to, uh, I mean, I provide a lot of latitude. I'm just trying to get answers to the specific questions because I, want to, I don't want to hog the whole the time. So I just want to cut things a little short here. And what I'm actually looking for, example, uh, what is the trigger 
in the context of uh, an action, uh, people, if they're all downtown on one given evening, and you've got a call for service that exceeds the capacity to deliver the service on the mountain, what level of call would you uh, consider releasing uh, one or two officers from the action team to meet the demand uh, in a different division? That depends on the uh, nature of the call. If it was a priority zero call involving imminent, imminent death or bodily harm, then my expectation would be that the uh, supervisors, including those at communications, those in the action team, and those on the mountain at the time, make that operational call and redeploy as they need. Okay, so it's got to be a fairly serious issue, what I'm hearing. Is that correct? That's correct. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, I, um, and I obviously got a number of questions, but I don't want to, uh, um, I think I'll take some of it offline in regards to the, uh, the charts. But I guess what concerns me is if you take a look in the last number of years, police budgets are eating up the capacity for municipalities to be able to deliver service. Quite frankly, uh, more than 2 to 3%. I think the one number that was uh, put out there is well over 5% uh, of across the province, not just here in Hamilton. I think the average is 5%. Uh, exceeding the averages of the departmental budgets with every city by at least 2%, 2.5%. And the problem is, is that as the, the budgets start uh, uh, growing exponentially, quite frankly, it's lowering the ability to deliver all those other services that the city taxpayers are relying on. So, because something has to give. So the problem is, is every year uh, you take a look at the police services budget, I don't think we've come in below cost of inflation ever, ever. In fact, we've exceeded uh, the last two or three years uh, well above the departmental budget. So when the council puts out a directive to the, the, to the departments, they delivered and met those targets. And they're doing without. They're making tough decisions. But they're meeting those targets. And yet, it's hard uh, to, with any credibility to continue asking them to, to, to try and uh, work with less, try and be effective and efficient in your delivery when the police services continue coming in, of course, this year at 5.25% which far exceeds the targets, far exceeds every department that's worked their butt off to try and meet those targets. And with any credibility, it's really difficult to continue to control uh, uh, the, the city budget if we can't get everyone working together to keep the, uh, the, the numbers down. So it's going to be very tough, very tough sell. And I, and, and, and I don't dispute uh, the need. What I dispute is, is this the time? I dispute the fact that we have what isn't taken into consideration is that we have an affordability issue in the city of Hamilton. It's absolutely clear from our own stats that we're not a York, we're not a Mississauga, we're not, even, we're not a Toronto. In Hamilton, we've got an affordability issue, the ability for people to pay their taxes. The medium income is one of the lower. Medium income is all Ontario. So when you look at 5.25%, uh, uh, increases, and you know, I heard the, the mayor speak about, well, it's only $30 on your, on your, on your tax bill this time around. It was $30 last year. It was $30 the year before. $30 the year, year before. So the cumulative impact at some point weighs heavily on the taxpayers of this community. And certainly those that are struggling to make ends meet. Certainly those that have found themselves with frozen salaries for the last number of years as a result of the downturn in the economy. So I understand the pressures. And I understand the, 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 the need to, to, to ensure that we don't create a community that is not worth investing in. I understand the balance that we need to strike. The question is, coming in at 20 officers at this time, is that striking the right balance? And I think that's the question many of the community will be asking. I've, I've received a lot of emails and phone calls, and I know my colleagues have because they certainly passed it on to me as well, that this is just unpalatable. So uh, I would ask uh, in the review, uh, if we we're sending it back and, and, and receiving, that we understand maybe a breakdown of the ask. You're asking for 20 officers. Maybe, uh, I, and many of my op or, uh, colleagues indicated that you've you got to freeze it. Because here's why. I'm going to give you a reason, one of the other reasons that we haven't talked about yet. The federal government announced just recently, and of course we know about it because I think you built part of this into your budget, that the, uh, the core funding was, is to end March 2013. I think that's built in the budget. The other thing that is identified in the, uh, the, the FCM report 
This police officer recruitment fund not to be renewed, renewed in 2013. My understanding is that's uh, $400 million that are being cut out of the budget on that one and $70 million on the other. So the municipalities will no longer have the ability to tap into those funds. And if they're not tapping on those funds, then obviously it has implication here in the city of Hamilton as well as many other communities. So could I ask through uh, the chair to, I guess it would Ted, what is the impact on the, uh, the ending or the, the sunset of the federal funds that we're receiving? What is the net impact? Uh, just before I ask uh, Mr. Mason to address that issue, um, it's an uh, interesting commentary that, uh, th that the board uh, made earlier about taking some time to actually receive the facts of the matter so that you can make a good decision. So let's fill in some of the uh, councillor's comments with some of the facts as it relates to the police service. As a percentage of the levy within the Hamilton Police Service and the, ha and the City of Hamilton, this service from 2003 to 2012 has always been about 18.5, 18.6% of the Hamilton levy. We have, in that time period, the budget increase of the Hamilton Police Service from 2003 to 2012 represents a pressure to the city of 47%. But while we're having the discussion about how it is the police budget that is driving the pressures of the city, Let's make sure that we have that discussion in, in, uh, in context. The Conservation Authority over the same time, 24.3%. The Library, 36%. HECFI, 39%. Uh, Department of Health, 22%. Uh, Hamilton Economic, and, uh, Economic Development, 67%. The Fire Service, 61%. The EMS, 64% in the context of the Hamilton Police Service sitting at 47%. So while I understand budget pressures, let's be abundantly clear that what is driving that is a part of the whole picture, being the Hamilton Police Service amongst other city agencies. Your comments with respect to what is the federal funding and the imp implications for that within the service. Uh, the mayor sits on the Affordable, Sustainable, Accountable Policing Committee, and I have a report of the FCM that is, that is before us. Uh, it, it identifies at the national level the sex offender registry. While we certainly support the sex offender registry, with that and when it was put in place comes an awful lot of work for the Hamilton Police Service. Uh, the DNA National Data Bank, we have now trained our special constables for the purpose of collecting the samples. We have streamlined our process around the issuance of those uh, processes from the judges. We now take them immediately at the courts. Inspector DiMazio was, imp uh, uh, was instrumental in, in establishing that and saving us a, a ton of money in getting that done. Uh, there are a number of pressures that are identified through FCM. And one of the biggest ones is that the policing and public safety is the fastest growing area of a municipal budget, often in many jurisdictions making up over 20% of the local spending. And we have checked into some of those areas that you referenced earlier that had growth, and they sit at 22 and 23 and 24 percent. That is not the case in Hamilton. We have never once reached 20 percent of the municipal levy. And I'd ask Mr. Mason to deal with the, uh, with the federal funding component. Through you, Madam Chair. Um, um, Councillor, you're, you're absolutely correct. The police officer's recruitment fund grant is... Uh, um, um, expiring on uh, March 31st of uh, 2013. Um, this year in the 2012 budget we have $490,000 in, in the budget. It will be reduced to $122,500 in next year in the 2013 budget. So that represents a, a decrease of $367,500 and uh, as a percentage of the 2012 budgets, that, that's 0.27% impact. Thank you. Um, Madam Chair, uh, I remember a, a letter from the, uh, I believe it was the chair of the police boards. And in that letter, and I have a copy of it, it indicates very clearly, very clearly because they're advocating and lobbying uh, the provincial government on the police services that the uh, police budgets across the province of Ontario, and not excluding Hamilton, is eating up the uh, provincial, sorry, the, the municipal budgets at a greater rate than any other department. And we have a copy of that letter. So that's a letter signed off by the, the chair of the 
police association, or shot the association, the police uh, boards. The other thing I want to indicate is I've been here for a while, for seven, eight years. And every year I've indicated, uh, and, and it's always been tough for me to support a budget that was over and above the targets. Not once in the seven years that I've been sitting around the council chamber that we meet, met the, the targets that uh, the city placed. So I just want to highlight those. Board member Levy. Um, with your permission, Madam Chair, to the Chief. You did highlight, or you talked about the seven year strategic plan and the hiring of, uh, and, and bringing in 20, 21 new recruits this year, new offices this year. You talked about in 2018 is your goal to have, and correct me if I'm wrong, to look at, you know, up to 140 new. Can you, can you just, you know, talk about the strategy and the, we, we hear the pressures, we understand the pressures that are on today and the pressures that are we face as a police service. How do you plan to roll that out and what would that look like perhaps next year and and down the road in order to, to fulfill the pressures and all of the, and then offset by retirees. So how would that look like in rolling out the strategic so we understand, you know, the conversations out there when, when the public looks at this budget, but also thinking forward, what does that look like as we roll out to 2018? So the report, uh, the report itself, uh, we commissioned uh, in 2011, uh, we commissioned Four, uh, four major areas to be looked at within the service and the strategic staffing plan was one. That committee was uh, run under the direction of Rosemary Ald, uh, the manager of, uh, of human resources. And what that did is that presents for us a pathway forward. Um, without having a strategic plan, uh, we're just a bunch of people that are going for a walk and we actually never know when we get there. And this service isn't going to do that. That's why we have the board's business plan. That's why we have a capital plan. That's why we have the human resources plan now. But an excellent question, you have to have the plan. But what we are in fact doing and have, have done over the last number of years is we have made an absolute commitment to the business uh, process re reorganization that took place in 2010. We then have looked at many of our systems, case prep being one of them. We have the enterprise resource manager on, on board now. We have the crime analysis. We have the plan that we feel is appropriate. However, as we did this year, we know that that plan calls for 61 individuals to come into the service. We recognize the economic impact of that, the, the situation the city is in the request uh, from council. But in delivering the service, we are allowing the projects that we have put in place to maximize their efficiencies and to produce the best that we possibly can so that we can reevaluate what that uh, yearly number actually looks like. So while the plan next year would call for five, that would be dependent on what takes place in this process. That would be dependent on the, on the continued business efficiencies that we put in place. When we move to a time and resource uh, uh, system and electronic scheduling of, of officers, we may in fact find additional efficiencies that will take that five off the board. What we need to have is a roadmap, but what we need to do is continue to support our business plan, our business re-engineering, and then make a constant assessment of what that means in coming forward. And I would remind, remind the board that we clearly displayed our commitment last year when we came in with the lowest budget in 10 years. And we will do that again where the situation allows for it and we will allow our business processes to be maximized. And these people behind me who are the senior leaders of this organization, they are doing an excellent job in making sure that those business processes are carried out by all of our people and they are producing excellence in policing. Thank you, Madam Chair, to uh, the Chief, if I may. Uh, first of all, just a comment, and I do want to uh, thank you and your staff for uh, taking the lead uh, and, and uh, having budget discussions uh, relatively early in the process, because uh, to my understanding, none of the departments have delivered or deliberated, uh, city departments have delivered uh, their budgets yet. So we have yet to see uh, uh, the other city departments, the councillors' budgets uh, yet, but they are yet to come. So it's always difficult being uh, 
number one or being the first out of the gate. Uh, my question is, though, uh, can you um, remind me what the budget increase would be without the 21 new staff? Uh, the 21 new staff uh, being removed would be 4.03. Uh, the totality of the uh, of the new um, the new additions is uh, uh, 1.66. Uh, Madam Chair, that I would consider to be pretty much a maintenance budget uh, without the 21 additional staff. Is that a fair characterization? Um, we well, we need to be uh, we need to be clear about what that would actually mean. Uh, budget of uh, 4.3 uh, would mean that those 20 officers uh, are not entering the service. So the decision at that point for the service is we have often, for the last number of years, is we have been doing more with less. At 4.03, we will be doing less with less, and we will be cutting 20 job functions within our organization if we are not approved for the 20 new positions. I have just one last question. If you could uh, maybe give us an indication or describe uh, as much as you're willing to, what those uh, reductions would actually look like so that the uh, public has an opportunity to, to realize the impact? Mm -hmm. uh, the command has met. Uh, um, there was a report that was uh, authored by Superintendent Stewart last year when we started looking at these, uh, these scenarios. Uh, Superintendent Stewart conducted uh, interviews with our senior uh, members, our senior officers. It has now come to the command. And uh, our position would be that we will be removing the following job functions uh, from the service. We will eliminate five school resource officers. We will eliminate five, uh, sorry, four station duty personnel from the stations and we will close the uh, mountain and we will close the East End Station after hours. Uh, public that would attend there, uh, like attending many jurisdictions across the province, there'll be a phone there that will connect them to the uh, connect them to communications. We will eliminate the nine crime managers, uh, and I certainly uh, recognize that this will be one of the substantial uh, best practices that have been established right here in Hamilton, uh, but we will no longer be able to afford that luxury, and we will be removing two of the unfunded positions from the four positions that are within the Coast team. Through you, Madam Chair, to the Chief. Um, I too have had a lot of people contact me because they know I'm on the board. And their question to me is, um, how can the police be asking for this kind of increase when the, uh, uh, we read that the crime rates are declining? And I, I tell them that um, it's because they're declining because the police are doing their job. But um, if we don't put more officers, then these rates could start going up. So this is the number one issue that the people are thinking about. But another really serious issue, and I know it's something that none of us can do anything about, and it's the police officers that are off on paid leave um, and not doing their jobs waiting for um, their cases to be cleared. So the, the public is hearing that we need a 5.2 um, increase, but meanwhile, all they're being fed is the information about crime rates and uh, these police officers being paid. And so how do you explain to them, how do you make them understand that in order for our public safety to, to continue the way it is, that we do need these extra officers. How do we get past these issues that the press keeps talking about and the, um, um, the public is being fed this information? Uh, those are normally uh, questions that are easily asked uh, by those that have neither the responsibility or accountability to produce public safety. Uh, the question to be asked is, what is the acceptable rate of victimization? How many people are you comfortable with as the number of victims that you would say is acceptable in our community? 
And I think the uh, I think the answer to that is quite clear. We want to drive that victimization rate down as far as we possibly can. Twenty years ago, when we adopted in policing the community-based policing philosophy, which has grown to a true collaborative partnership in policing, if you had shown, if you could show those people twenty years ago what the crime rates would look like, what the declines would look like in terms of, of the crime rate, the crime severity, the violent crime index, the issues with respect to protecting women from domestic violence and sexual assault and children from child exploitation. If you showed them where we would be today, they would be championing, they would be standing up saying that we are a major success. And yet here we are having produced that, and I understand the affordability component of it, we are questioning ourselves from the success that we have been asked to produce. And it is the rate of victimization that we will focus on for public safety. The issue has been uh, well uh, supported by this service uh, with respect to the uh, comments on suspension with, with, with and without pay. Um, the position of our service is that the legislation should be opened and provide chiefs the authority to make a discretionary decision and then build in a protection for the members to appeal the decision and to have a proper airing of the reasons for that. It's what happens in other jurisdictions. It's what happens right across this, right across this country. So I would think that what we need to focus on and what are the things that, that we need to continue to pay attention to is the incidence of how many people are killed on our roadway the incidence of how many people are victimized by violent crime, the incidence increasing in the amount of sexual assault predominantly per perpetrated by men against women in our community rose by 50 cases last year from 412 to 462. We have got a lot of work to do in those areas. So one would expect that in tough economic times we would be restricting the investment in policing and I would respectfully submit that that is absolutely the wrong thing to do. Now is the time to make sure that we maintain and sustain our ability to produce public safety. The measure of success in policing is not our response to crime. The measure of success in policing is in fact the absence of crime. Thank you, Chief. Madam Chair, if there are no further questions, I would move seconded by Councillor Morelli that we receive the uh, 2013 Hamilton Police Service operation, operating budget request and refer it back to the board for further discussion and questions. I, think I, just, I should have asked this, but the stats bear this out that this, the police have provided us. Uh, a number of cases in regards to these crime reports, and you said, uh, and, this, and it was a great. Uh, uh, answered in response to the previous speaker, um, but there's a number of cases uh, in these charts that show that uh, that communities with much higher uh, or, or more officers per hundred thousand are in fact got higher crime or, or very close to us if you took the ratio uh, with the amount of staff they have per hundred thousand than the city of Hamilton. So I guess the point I'm making, just to have more officers, doesn't necessitate or doesn't uh, indicate that your numbers will go down. I guess it's how you police and the effectiveness of policing because obviously we've been very effective in the last three or four years to get the numbers we are receiving but when you see again uh, Windsor at, at, at some of those indexes you, you identify in the report the 224 officers per 100,000 uh, in fact we're outperforming Windsor in some of these uh, indicators with 150 per 100,000. So I guess my, and there's a few other examples, whether it's Thunder Bay or Toronto or whatever. So my point is be careful that we don't say the only, or suggest that the only solution to get better policing in the city of Hamilton is that you need to hire more police. Because it, these numbers don't suggest that. It suggests that that might be part of the solution, but obviously effective policing is equally important. Wouldn't you say? To the and. And that's, uh, that's a, an excellent observation, and it is absolute confirmation that our, our strategy has not been that simplistic. 
That's why it has been with restructuring. That's why it's been with reorganization. That's why it's been with business process reengineering. That's why it's been with the action strategy. That's why it's been with the, the navi uh, social navigator project. It's why we've put so much effort into the youth diversion programs. It's why our officers are in the schools and dealing proactively with uh, the issues that confront our young people and looking for ways to keep them out of the judicial system. So I'm in full agreement with you. It's about the way that we police. However, in looking at the totality of the picture that presents itself to the Hamilton Police Service, we are in no way able to, to maintain our current day status without the increase of officers and the increase in funding. Madam Chair, I would just like to certainly comment in closing, and that's that, uh, first of all, you know, I know that uh, we all understand our roles and, and our individual roles. I, I think the presentation tonight has been terrific. I want to make it very clear, though, that as a board, certainly from my position, and I know my colleagues agree, that uh, we as a board, in carrying out our duties, and obviously this becomes our budget, uh, inevitably, uh, we also want to salute the, the excellence of all our civilian and sworn people and certainly are on the same page. So this is just a matter of us sorting out the challenges. Uh, obviously, uh, the chief is here tonight to to un sell a budget that, that he feels is reflective, but I want to make it very clear that we're, our role is to to assure that uh, we uh, come back with the, the proper feedback from community and do everything we need to do with that perspective uh, in governance. And, uh, and no matter how you cut it, uh, this is not about the excellence of our service. But, and I, I think it's important that, that we as a board convey that very clearly to these people, as he referred to in the upper uh, behind them there, that, 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 that we believe in you and we continue to believe in you. And somehow we'll get through this. This is not an unusual process. This is a very a common one in many respects. It's just getting tougher each and every year. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor Morelli. And at the end of the day, it is the board budget. We do have a motion on the motion floor. Motion to receive and yes. uh, refer the budget uh, back to the board for further discussion and question. All in favor? Chief, on behalf of uh, the board, we would like to sincerely thank you and the team for the outstanding presentation. We know much work has gone into this, and we really appreciate uh, the details and um, the work that all the members of the team have done. So thank you, and we look forward to our next meeting when I know you have received enough information uh, for you to be able to answer uh, questions when we come back the next time. Thank you. Can I have a motion to adjourn, please? Station and uh, Morelli.